The Battle of Kings Mountain was fought on October 7, 1780 and is one of the pivotal battles of the American Revolutionary War. Thomas Jefferson called it the turn of the tide of success. It had inspired more people to join the Patriot cause, and it got the over-mountain men who had declared their own independence before 1776 into the war on the Patriots' side. This battle is also noteworthy because the only Englishman on the field was Major Patrick Ferguson, leader of the Loyalist forces. Something a lot of people don't know about the battle is that there were a lot of British military politics that were at play here, and these politics eventually led to Major Patrick Ferguson being killed in battle. To fully understand who was fighting on both sides, we have to go back a few months when on May 22, 1780, Patrick Ferguson was made inspector of the militia and tasked with creating a strong and highly trained Loyalist army capable of taking the backwoods of the Carolinas. The British Army had struggled to get control of the backwoods, mainly in South Carolina, and they hoped North Carolina would be more open to British rule, and Ferguson was immediately tasked with setting up operations in North Carolina to prepare for a major British campaign led by General Charles Cornwallis. Meanwhile, on the Patriot side, on August 18, 1780, 200 mounted Patriot partisans under joint command of Colonels Isaac Shelby, James Williams, and Elijah Clark prepared to raid a Loyalist camp in Musgrove's Mill, which controlled the local grain supply and guarded a ford of the Anacree River. The Patriots anticipated surprising a garrison of about an equal number of Loyalists, but a local farmer informed them that the Tories had recently been reinforced by about 100 Loyalist militia and 200 provincial regulars on their way to join British Major Patrick Ferguson. The battle lasted about an hour, and 63 Loyalists were killed, and 70 were taken prisoner, while the Patriots only lost about 4 men and 12 wounded. The Patriot commanders contemplated attacking the Loyalist garrison at 96, but after hearing of the Continental Army defeat at the Battle of Camden, they dispersed back into the woods and mountains, all the while Shelby was being pursued by Ferguson. Shelby's forces covered 60 miles with Ferguson in hot pursuit before making their escape. Shelby and his over mountain men crossed back over the Appalachian Mountains and retreated back into the territory of the Watauga Association at Sycamore Shoals in present day Elizabethan, Tennessee. And by the next month, on September 25, 1780, Colonel Shelby, John Sevier, and Charles McDowell and their 800 over mountain men had combined forces with Colonel William Campbell and his 400 Virginia men at the Sycamore Shoals muster in advance of the October 7, 1780 Battle of Kings Mountain, north of present day Blacksburg, South Carolina, in North Carolina. On September 2nd, Ferguson and the militia he had already recruited marched west in pursuit of Shelby towards the Appalachian Mountain Hill Country and what is now the Tennessee North Carolina border. And by September 10th, Ferguson had established a base camp at Gilbert Town in North Carolina, and he issued a challenge to the Patriot leaders to lay down their arms or he would lay waste to their country with fire and sword. Patriot leaders also sent word to a Virginia militia leader, William Campbell, asking him to join them at Sycamore Shoals. Campbell called on Benjamin Cleveland to bring his Wilkes County, North Carolina militiamen to the rendezvous. The detachments of Shelby, Sevier, and Campbell were met by 160 North Carolina militiamen led by Charles McDowell and his brother Joseph, Campbell's cousin. Arthur Campbell brought 200 more Virginians and about 1,100 volunteers from Southwest Virginia and today's Northeast Tennessee known as the Over Mountain Men because they had settled into the wilderness west of the Appalachian Mountain Ridgeline, mustered at the rendezvous on September 25, 1780 at Sycamore Shoals. Their movement had been made possible by easing tensions with Cherokee tribes thanks to diplomacy by Benjamin Cleveland's brother-in-law, Indian agent Joseph Martin. By September 30th, the Patriots now numbered about 1,400 and were still growing. The five colonels leading the Patriot force met and chose William Campbell as the lead commander of the army, but they agreed that all five would act in council to command their combined army. Meanwhile, two deserters from the Patriot Militia reached Patrick Ferguson and informed him of the large body of militia advancing towards him. Waiting three days for reasons that are still unclear, Ferguson ordered a retreat to Laura Cornwallis and the British main forces in Charlotte, North Carolina, sending a message to Cornwallis requesting reinforcements. Historically, it's said that Cornwallis didn't receive the report until one day after the battle, but some people say that he did receive the order and he ordered the British Legion under the command of Bannister Tarleton to reinforce Ferguson, but Tarleton never had any intentions of helping Ferguson because at the start of the Southern Campaign during the Siege of Charleston, Ferguson refused to work with Tarleton, saying he's just a young boy and he's unfit to lead troops in battle. 
Tarleton's excuse to Cornwallis was that he was attacked by Indians and was unable to reach Ferguson in time. On October 6th, the Patriot Army reached Calpin, South Carolina. Here they received word that Ferguson was east of them, heading towards Charlotte and Cornwallis. They hurried to catch him, and rebel spies had reported Ferguson was making camp on Kings Mountain with some 1,200 men, and Ferguson decided to rest his men and he set up very light defenses around the mountain and let his men rest for the night. Needing to hurry, the Patriot militia put 900 men on horseback and rode for Kings Mountain. They left immediately, marching through the night on the 6th and morning of the 7th, even though the rain never stopped. By sunrise of October 7th, 1780, they forded the Broad River, 15 miles from Kings Mountain, and by that afternoon, they were ready to begin the attack. Before the battle, one of Ferguson's men tried to convince him to bolster his defenses, but Ferguson responded with these now infamous words, Not even God could get me off this mountain. These words would prove fatal in just a few hours. At about 3 p.m., the first shots by Patriot skirmishers were fired. The plan was to surround the mountain and slowly advance up the ridge and eliminate the Loyalist army. The Patriots caught the Loyalists by surprise, and Loyalist officer Alexander Chesney later wrote he didn't know the Patriots were anywhere near to them until the shooting began. The Patriots crept up the hill and fired from behind rocks and trees, and Ferguson rallied his troops and launched a desperate bayonet charge against Campbell and Severe. Lacking bayonets, the Patriots ran down the hill and into the woods. Campbell soon rallied his troops, returned to the hill, and resumed firing. Ferguson ordered two more bayonet charges during the battle. This became a pattern of the battle. The Patriots would charge up the hill, then the Tories would charge down the hill with fixed bayonets driving the Patriots off the slopes and into the woods. Once again, the charge was spent and the Tories returned to their positions. The Patriots would reform in the woods, return to the base hill, and charge up the hill again. During one of the charges, Colonel Williams was killed and Colonel McDowell was wounded. After an hour of fighting, Loyalist casualties were starting to mount up. Ferguson rode back and forth across the hill, blowing a silver whistle he used to signal charges. Shelby, Severe, and Campbell reached the top of the hill behind the Loyalist position and attacked Ferguson's rear. The Loyalists were driven back into their camp where they began to surrender. Ferguson drew his sword and hacked down any small white flags that he saw popping up, but he appeared to know that the end was near. In an attempt to rally his faltering men, Ferguson shouted, Hurrah, brave boys! The day is ours! He got a few officers with him and tried to ride through the Patriot line to escape, but Severe's men fired a volley and Ferguson was shot and dragged by his horse behind the Patriot line. There, he was confronted by an opposing rebel officer who demanded a surrender from the Major. Ferguson shot and killed the man with his, with his pistol in a final act of defiance, but was immediately shot dead by multiple Patriots on the spot. When the Patriots recovered his corpse, they counted seven bullet wounds in his body. After Ferguson had been killed, the Loyalists started surrendering, but some of the Patriots started yelling, Tarleton's Quarter, and they attacked and killed the surrendering Loyalists until Patriot colonels restored order and ended the fighting. The battle lasted about 65 minutes, and the Loyalists suffered 290 killed, 163 wounded, and 668 taken prisoner. The Patriot militia suffered 28 killed and 60 wounded. The dead were buried in shallow graves and wounded were left on the field to die. Ferguson's corpse was later reported to have been desecrated and wrapped in oxhide before burial. On October 14th, the retreating Patriot forces held drumhead court-martials of loyalists on various charges and nine men were hanged before Shelby put a stop to the trials. Many of the Patriots dispersed over the next few days while all but 130 of the loyalist prisoners escaped while being led in single file through woodlands. The battle rallied the Patriot militias all over the Carolinas and even the Continental Army who had suffered a string of bad defeats recently. The battle would mark the turning point of the war and secured Patriot support in the backwoods of North Carolina for the rest of the war.